This is Jeremy Clark of JeremyBytes.com, and today we're going to continue our series on task and await in C-sharp. This time we'll be taking a look at basic exception handling when we're using task or await. As a reminder, we're working with the task asynchronous pattern. This is task-based, and a task represents a concurrent operation. Now once we start talking about exceptions happening on other threads, things start to get interesting, so we'll see how we can handle that using task directly. And last time we saw how the await operator can help us hide a lot of this complexity. And we'll see that exception handling with await is pretty straightforward, but we do get some more power if we use task directly. So our focus should really be picking the right tool for the job. So let's flip over to our code and get going with this. So here we are in Visual Studio, and as a reminder, here's the asynchronous method that we're consuming. Now the interesting part is this does return a task of list of person. So this represents a task that will ultimately return to us a list of person as a result. And we saw how to consume this method two different ways. We use the task directly, and in that case we created a continuation. The continuation runs after the task is completed, and we did have to add the task scheduler dot from current synchronization context to make sure that our continuation ran on our UI thread. That's because we're interacting with the UI elements directly here. Using the await operator is quite a bit more straightforward. In fact, it looks just like synchronous code. The only difference is we have the await operator before we call the get method. The result is that it will pause this method until that task returns, and then it will pick up from where it left off. And if we run our application, we'll see both of these have the same result. So if I click on fetch data with task, I do have that three second delay we have to wait for, and then our data is populated. And we see the same thing if I click the fetch data with await button. Now before moving on to exception handling, I want to point out a small problem that we have with our UI. Because our methods are asynchronous, that means our UI stays responsive while we're waiting for our task to complete. But there's a problem with that. Because if I click the task button, and then click the task button again before it comes back, notice that we just got two result sets crammed into our UI. And the exact same thing is true if we use our await button. So if I click it, and then click it again before the results have come back, we'll see that first set comes back, and then we get another set of results. Now why do we have this problem? To figure this out, we need to look at where we call clear list box. Notice that it's at the top of both of our button click methods. This means that when I click the button, it will immediately clear the list box. Then if I click the button again before any data has come back, it will clear the list box again. But then because of the asynchronous nature of our code, our data starts to return. So that first data set will come back, and then that second data set will come back, and our methods are happy to continue from where they left off. So this is why we end up with multiple data sets inside of our output box. Now let's go ahead and fix this. And to do this, I'm just going to update our UI a little bit, and let's do our await button first. So all I'm going to do is take our fetch with await button, and set its is enabled property to false at the top of this method. So this will disable the button so that I can't click it again. And then at the bottom of the method, we'll go ahead and re-enable it by setting it back to true. And then if we run our application, we'll see that our problem is solved. Once I click the button, it's now disabled so that I cannot click it again. And then once our data comes back, it re-enables. So let's go ahead and watch that again. I'll click it, our button is disabled, and then it's re-enabled once our data comes back. Now this isn't the best code at this point, because what happens if an exception or other problem happens in the middle of this method? Well, our button will not be re-enabled. So to make sure that our button is always re-enabled, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this in a try finally block. Now I love code snippets, and there's a great keyboard shortcut, Control K, Control S for surround with. So I highlighted the block of code, pressed Control KS, and now I'm going to type in try F, which is our snippet for a try finally block. And now when I hit enter, we see that the block of code that I had highlighted is now wrapped in a try. Now I will need to move the part where we're re-enabling our button into the finally block, and then this will get us the behavior that we want. So at the top of the method, our button is disabled, then we run the main body of our code, and then we re-enable the button at the end. And again, if something goes wrong in the middle, we still re-enable the button. Let's just verify that this still works. So again, I click the button, it's disabled, so I can't click it again. 
and then it's re-enabled once the data returns. So let's do the same thing with our task method. So up here in our task, at the very top of the method, we'll just disable the button. So this will be the fetch with task button is enabled equals false. And then I might be tempted to re-enable it down here at the bottom of the method by setting it back to true. But if we do that, we won't get the results that we expect. In fact, if I click the button, it just re-enables immediately. And the reason for that is that we do have that asynchronous portion in the middle of our method. So really what I need to do is I need to put this inside the continuation that I have. So we'll go ahead and put this inside our continue with method so that this will run after we populate our list box. And so now if we do this and click the button, we'll see that our button is disabled. And then after our data comes back, it's re-enabled. Now we do have the same problem with this block of code. What happens if we get an exception somewhere in here before we can re-enable our button? Well, to explore this further, we'll look at actual exception handling when we're dealing with these asynchronous methods. So let's cause an exception. So inside of my get method, after I do my task.delay, I'm going to throw a new not implemented exception. And we'll say get method is not implemented. Now I'm doing this after the delay so that we can still see our asynchronous method running and then the exception will happen after that pause. And before we make any changes to our client code, let's go ahead and see what the current behavior is. And again, we'll start with the await button. So we'll go ahead and click on fetch data with await, and then we'll wait our three seconds. And then what we'll see is we have an unhandled exception in our code. And if we look at the additional information, we see it says get method is not implemented, the actual method from the exception that we threw. Now this code is pretty easy to fix. In fact, I already have the try block, which means I just need to add a catch block to this too. And in this case, I'm just going to catch exception. I won't catch that specific not implemented exception. And as we can see, exception is not coming up. That's because I haven't added the system namespace in my using statement. But notice the little purple underline under the E? That's Visual Studio offering to help me out. So if I press control dot, we'll see that one of the options is using system. So I just hit enter there and it adds that using statement to the top of my class for me. So inside our block, we'll just do a message box dot show and we'll show the exception message. And I'm also going to give it a caption of exception. That's because later on we will be dealing with cancellation and I wanna make sure we know which message boxes are popping up. So with our catch block in place, let's go ahead and run our application again. We'll click on our wait button and we'll see we do get a message box that pops up that says get method is not implemented. Now, one other thing to note is that our fetch data button is still disabled. That's because this is a modal dialog. And so we haven't run that finally block yet in our method. Once I click OK, that finally block will run and our button will re-enable. So we've seen by using the await operator that our code is pretty easy to work with. In fact, this looks pretty much like any other method that we would write, even if we're not using asynchronous code. So now let's take a look to see how our task code behaves when we're dealing with this manually. Before I make any changes to code, let's go ahead and just run our application. So we'll click on the fetch data with task and then wait our three seconds. And then we'll see we do get an exception. But notice that this exception is different from what we saw when we used the await operator. The additional information says one or more errors occurred. So it's not actually showing us the message from the exception that was thrown. So what's going on here? Well, exceptions normally stay on the thread that they were thrown on. That means if we don't do anything special, we're not gonna get those exceptions across threads. Now, the reason why we're seeing it here is because we're trying to access the result property of our task. If an exception is thrown on that task, then the task moves into what's known as the faulted state. And if the task is in the faulted state, the result property is not valid. So if we try to access the result property on a faulted task, we will get an exception message. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So how should we take care of this? There's actually a couple different approaches we can take. This time what I'm gonna show you is how we can be a little more specific with our continuations. Now, when we looked at our continue with method last time, 
we saw that there were 40 different overloads. And in fact, we're using this one right here that takes a continuation action and a task scheduler. Well, there are a number of other options as well. And I want to look for something that takes task continuation options. And for that, I know that we're looking for number 33. So I'm just going to jump ahead here. Now, one of the problems with this is that even though it does have the task continuation options that I want, as well as the task scheduler that I need, it also wants a cancellation token. Well, I'm not dealing with cancellation yet, so what can I do here? Well, we can actually pass in a placeholder cancellation token. So I'm just gonna type in cancellation token. And then notice how I have the red squigglies on this, but I do have that little purple underline. So I'll do control dot, and we'll see we have the option of adding using system.threading to the top of our class. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then there is a static property that we can use, which is cancellation token dot none. So this will be a placeholder token that we don't have to interact with, but we can still use it easily if we need it for a method parameter. Now, what I really want to get to is the task continuation options, because this is where things get interesting. So task continuation options is actually an enum, and we can see that there's a big list here to choose from. So we can say deny child attach, lazy cancellation, etc. But I really want to take a look at these ones that say not and only. So we have not on canceled, not on faulted, and not on ran to completion. So I can say I only want to run this continuation if the task is not in the faulted state. And on the flip side, we have the onlys. So we have only on canceled, only on faulted, and only on ran to completion. Now in this case, I want to use only on ran to completion. So what that will mean is that our continuation will only run if our task completed and it's not faulted and it's also not canceled. So let's go ahead and run our application right now to see what will happen. So I click on the button and we'll see it's disabled and then we'll wait our three seconds and then we'll wait another three seconds. So this continuation is not going to run because we did not complete successfully. Now the problem is the code that's re-enabling our button is also in that block. So before we handle the exception, I really want to pull that code out. And for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another continuation. Now, again, there are a couple of different ways of dealing with this, but I'm just going to say people task dot continue with, and we'll use T with our goes to operator. Then we'll have the body of our Lambda expression. And inside here, we're going to use our fetch with task button dot is enabled true. Now I do need the task scheduler because again, I'm interacting with UI elements here. So I am going to say task scheduler from current synchronization context, but I don't need task continuation options in this case. That's because I want this code to always run. If things complete successfully, it should run. If I get an exception, it should run. And even if the process is canceled, I want this to run. So now let's run our application and see what happens. So we click on the fetch with data button. We see it's enabled. And after three seconds, it re-enables. But notice nothing else happens. Like I said earlier, exceptions will stay on the threads where they're generated. So that not implemented exception is generated on the thread of our task. So we don't see it on the UI thread. But as you can imagine, I can create another continuation that we can use for exception handling. Now to make things a little easier, since there's a lot of parameters, I'm just going to copy and paste our successful continuation. And then we'll get rid of the body of the method for now. And then I'm going to change my task continuation options from only on ran to completion to only on faulted. So I only want this code to run if we do have a faulted task. So let's go ahead and put in some of our exception handling code. Now, again, in this case, I just want to show a message to the user to let them know that something went wrong with the process. So just like when we were using the await operator, I'll do a message box dot show and I need to get to the exception. Well, it turns out task has a property called exception. So I can say T dot exception dot message. And then again, we'll say exception as the caption for this particular box. Now let's see what happens when we run our application. So I click the button and then we'll wait our three seconds. And then we'll see, we do have a message box that pops up. 
But again, this doesn't have the error message that I expect. It says one or more errors occurred. It's not giving me the message from that not implemented exception. Now to understand why, we need to take a look at the exceptions that we have in the task and why they are that way. So back in our code, if I hover over exception, notice that this is an aggregate exception. What's an aggregate exception? Well, it's an exception that holds other exceptions. Now, why do we need this? Well, let's think about the power of tasks. Again, we can have a parent that spawns off multiple child tasks. We can have tasks that are combined into a single operation. We can chain them together with continuations. And we need to be able to manage those exceptions somehow. So let's say that we have a task that kicks off five child tasks. Two of those tasks generate exceptions. Well, that means our main task will go into a faulted state, but what should the exception be? Well, we don't wanna just pick the first exception that we get. So what we do is we take both of the exceptions that we got from the operation and put them into a single aggregate exception. Now this does have an inner exceptions property. And with that, we can look at all of the exceptions that have been collected. But the problem is that inner exceptions collection can also contain aggregate exceptions. So because we're dealing with task, we don't know how many exceptions that we'll have and it could be aggregate exceptions all the way down. So how do we navigate that tree? Well, fortunately, there's a way that we can deal with this. So the first thing that I'm going to do is take a look at our t.exception, and this has a method called flatten. Now what flatten will do is take all of those aggregate exceptions and smash them down to a single level. So we no longer have this tree structure, Instead, we just have a flattened collection of all of the exceptions that were in there. Now we may or may not want to do this depending on what our application is doing. But in our case, we'll go ahead and flatten them so that we can see the exceptions that happened in a single collection. So now I can look at the inner exceptions and this is a read-only collection of exception. Now one thing that I can do with a read-only collection is iterate over it with a for each loop. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So we'll say for each var ex in inner exceptions and we'll do message box dot show but instead of doing it on the main exception we'll do it on each iteration that comes through now i wouldn't necessarily recommend doing this in a production application this way but what we can see is that it's really easy to get a collection of exceptions that we can iterate through in case we want to send them off to logging or some other system so now let's run our application and see how it behaves so when I click on the button, we can see that it's disabled. And then once our three seconds is done, we do get our pop-up box, but notice the message this time, get method is not implemented. So we're getting the actual message from the not implemented exception that was thrown in our asynchronous method. And then if I click okay, if there were other exceptions thrown, then I would get those message boxes as well. Now in this case, we only have a single exception. So when I click okay, our process is finished. But before I do that, I want to point out that the fetch data with task button has been re-enabled. And that's different behavior than we had when we were using the await operator. When we used await, the button wasn't re-enabled until after we cleared our message box. So let's go back to our code and see why this behavior is a little bit different. Now when we call our get method, we get a task back that we assign to our people task variable. Then we have three separate continuations on that same task. Now these continuations don't run in series, they just run whenever they can according to what their current task scheduler is. Now if we look at our continue with method, what we'll see is this also returns a task. So if we wanted, we could create an actual chain of tasks here, where we wait for one continuation to complete and then call the next one, wait for that one to complete and then call the next one. Now I won't do that in this case because we want our final continuation where we re-enable the button to run whether it's successful or whether we get an exception. Now in the next episode, we'll take a look at a different way of handling this where we just have a single continuation that would handle all of the states. Again, the most powerful thing we get when we're dealing with tasks is the flexibility of how we put the different pieces together. So let's review our functionality one more time. When we're dealing with tasks directly, we have a continuation for the success state. And we note this by using the only on ran to completion task continuation option. 
And again, since we're using the task scheduler from the current synchronization context, we're specifying that we want this code to run on the UI thread. Now we have a second continuation, and it has an only on faulted task continuation option specified. That means this will only run if the task generates an exception. And then on our last continuation, we have no task continuation option specified. That means we want this to always run. And again, we do need to be on the UI thread here because we're re-enabling one of the buttons on our screen. Now, when we look at our await operator method, we see this is much simpler. So rather than having separate continuations, we just have try catch finally blocks like we would have in our ordinary code. And because of the simplicity and readability of this, I would highly recommend using this wherever you can. But it is good to know that the full power of task is available to us so that we can have our code do exactly what we need it to do. So let's just run our application and see how our behavior is again. So if I click fetch data with task, our button is disabled. And then when the exception comes back, we have our exception pop-up come up and our button is re-enabled. When I click the fetch with await button, again, our button is disabled. And then once it comes back, we do show the exception message. And then once we clear that, our button is re-enabled. Now let's just make sure our success state works. So we'll go back to our asynchronous method and I will comment out the exception. And so now if we run our application, we we'll click our fetch with task button. And again, our button disables. And then once our data comes back, it re-enables. And then fetch with await does the same thing. So we can see that our code works both with our success state and if our task happens to throw an exception. So that's it for our look at basic exception handling with task and await. Next time, we'll dive a little bit deeper into some other options that we have. So rather than having three separate continuations, it's easy to create a single continuation and then use some properties on the task to figure out which code we want to run. Until then, be sure to visit www.jeremybytes.com for more information, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.